السلام عليكم السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام صوتي واضح اي واضح تفضل اخر وي ويل ستارت ات 105 ان شاء الله
السلام عليكم جميعا Welcome to our Saudi Board of Cardiac Surgery Weekly Academic Activity. Today's session uh, will be uh, basic, uh, Basics of Cardiopulmonary Bypass by our colleague, Dr. Khaled al -Garni. The next session will be Cardiopulmonary Bypass Pitfalls and uh, Management by Dr. Anouf al -Hami. And the last session will be Left Heart Bypass by Dr. Abdul Aziz al -Juhim. So, uh, I would like to uh, invite our colleague, Dr. Khalid, to start the first lecture. And uh, me, who, for those who doesn't know me, I'm uh, Murtadha al -Awami. I'm R7 and the Chief Resident uh, in Prince Sultan Cardiac Center, Riyadh. And uh, Dr. Abdullah Mohammed al-Shahri, the Chief Resident in uh, um, Saud al Baptin Cardiac Center in Dammam. Uh, we both will uh, moderate uh, the sessions for today. So without further ado, if, uh, if you are ready, Dr. Khalid, you can start, please. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Dr. Murtaba. Uh, I'm Khalid al Garni, R4 from King Bahad Medical City, Riyadh. Uh, today, my talk will be about uh, basics of cardiopulmonary bypass. So, to start with, this is my uh, talk outlines. I will talk about the basic components of cardiopulmonary bypass, mechanism of the perfusion system, assembly and priming, how to conduct the bypass, and how to monitor the adequacy and safety of perfusion, and ending with uh, weaning from bypass. So uh, the whole idea of cardiopulmonary bypass is to exclude the heart and lung. And uh, if we want to do so, we need to replace the function of both the heart and lung. So we'll need to take the patient uh, venous blood and bump it, uh, store it in reservoir, and then bump it to the uh, oxygenator, and then we'll return it back to the patient. And this is uh, how it's actually looked like. So the uh, blood will drain through the uh, venous line into a venous reservoir bag. And then the blood will be pumped uh, through a centrifugal or rural pump to an integrated oxygenator with a heat uh, exchanger unit for uh, uh, temperature control and uh, gas exchange. And then the uh, blood will return back to the the, uh, through the, an arterial filter to the arterial circulation by the A-line. And for the blood cardioplegia setups, a mixture of the blood from the oxygenator and from a stock of cardioplegia solution is bumped through an, a roller pump, a separate uh, roller pump using a different size uh, tubing and uh, will be returned back to the ascending aorta for integrated cardioplegia uh, delivery and the uh, coronary sinus for retrograde cardioplegia. And the heater uh, cooler system is used for systemic and cardioplegia temperature management. For vents and uh, suckers, the blood will be drained also uh, through the vents and sucker and will be actively suctioned using a roller pump into the cardiotomy reservoir and will be drained into the uh, venous reservoir. And this is the typical setup of the circuit, simplified. So moving to the mechanism of the perfusion system, uh, to achieve adequate tissue perfusion while bypassing the heart and lungs, the system must uh, fulfill adequate uh, venous drainage 
and we uh, for adequate uh, venous uh, retail, uh, it depends on uh, an extracted flow, whether uh, from inappropriate cannula size or presence of king or air, whatever. Uh, good intravascular volume in the patient. Uh, for example, in case of uh, bleeding. For adequate gas exchange, it depends on the oxygen concentration on the uh, gas controlled by FiO2 and the gas flow rate uh, uh, will uh, control the rate by sweep, ga sweep gas. And for appropriate pump flow, uh, in terms of uh, generating adequate uh, MAP, it depends on the uh, venous return and a proper calibration of the pump uh, and unobstructed systemic flow and appropriate systemic vascular uh, resistance. And to achieve this, let's discuss each uh, relevant component of the uh, bypass system. So what are the principles of venous drainage? The uh, venous drainage depends on gravity or what's called the uh, siphon effect. Uh, so in order to have successful drainage, logically the reservoir must be below uh, the patient, usually uh, 40 to uh, 70 centimeter. And, uh, Ideally, there shouldn't be an air in the tube to prevent airlock. And the amount of drainage, in the other hand, it depends on central venous pressure or uh, how much blood volume the patient have and the compliance of the venous system, which is affected during, uh, during a cardiopulmonary bypass by uh, different means in uh, systemic uh, sympathetic tone uh, by anesthetic drugs and uh, other medications. Also, how much negative pressure is exerted by uh, gravity, which equals this height differential in uh, centimeters of water. And if we had excessive uh, drainage faster than the venous return, this uh, can cause the venous uh, wall to be sucked on the uh, cannula, or what's called uh, line shattering and cause intermittent reduction of drainage, which can be easily uh, corrected by partial occlusion of the line. And of course, the uh, resistance in the line of the drainage at any point. We can use also augmented uh, venous drainage by uh, vacuum assisted or pump assisted uh, pressure, usually negative pressure minus 20 to uh, 40 millimeter mercury and it's useful uh, for peripheral cannulation in case of jugular or uh, femoral veins uh, or miniature uh, circuit or mini circuit. Uh, disadvantages, uh, it uh, precipitates uh, sh line shattering and hemolysis and it will increase the risk of air embolism, especially with uh, higher uh, pressure. Moving to uh, cannulas and uh, size selection, to uh, select an appropriate uh, cannula size, it's very important, especially for small patients uh, with small uh, aorta and, and aortic road diameter, older patients with peripheral vascular disease who need a higher map, and uh, for minimal uh, invasive access when you will use um, a narrow and long cannulas. To select the size, you have to uh, first to know uh, your maximum flow. And uh, this will be calculated based on the uh, higher cardiac index uh, wanted multiplied by the patient uh, body surface area. And then you will get a range of cannulas which can provide this flow. Uh, you can easily uh, find it uh, if you ask the perfusionist they have these uh, kind of uh, schedules for uh, selecting the cannulas. And the option checked for the uh, uh, pressure loss due to the resistance in the cannula also as well. We have many types of uh, and shapes of uh, venous cannulas. It depends on the cannulation technique. Uh, surgeon preference plays uh, a role as well. And in general, the uh, right angle uh, cannulas are used for direct by cable cannulation and the straight one for indirect by cable. And the metal tip 
provide a better drainage with a smaller size and the long cannulas for a minimal uh, invasive approach. For venous cannulation access, if we we'll go with atrial or cable atrial uh, cannulation, we'll drain the RA and IVC for extracardiac procedure or aortic valve, for example, uh, uh, using a dual uh, stage cannula. And care must be taken during uh, lifting the heart due to kinking of the uh, uh, superior cable atrial junction. And this will decrease the drainage from SVC and uh, it will uh, precipitate the risk of uh, brain edema by obstructing the uh, venous return from the uh, edemic. For direct and indirect by cable cannulation, single cannula for SVC and one uh, in IVC usually for open heart uh, procedure. And uh, we'll need to uh, use a tourniquet or snares to prevent uh, bleeding in the uh, field and air entry into the circuit. For femoral cannulation, usually for emergency cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, for high risk uh, reduce and uh, thoracotomy, and for ECMO and minimal invasive cannulation. And uh, here is a, a table which showed a comparison between the uh, different uh, techniques and uh, cannulas. In summary, the uh, caboatrial cannulation is easier, uh, practical, and can be used for a low risk cabbage, aortic valve, and even sometimes mitral valve surgery with left atrial approach. And the bicable, on the other hand, is a bit more difficult uh, technically, uh, but it's uh, it will provide a better drainage when you lift the heart for distal anastomosis, for example, and a better myocardial protection because you will exclude the heart totally from the systemic uh, circulation and thus uh, prevent the uh, rewarming effect. And finally, in case you need a retrograde uh, coronary sinus cannula during cabbage or uh, uh, AVR, you can uh, snare and open and put directly if blind approach is difficult. Uh, moving to our arterial uh, cannulas, uh, same like the uh, venous cannula, uh, no ma major uh, differences in the uh, types of cannulas, and it may, uh, it may be. Um, a surgeon preference or some cannulas uh, were designed previously to decrease the jet effect or on uh, a thromatous uh, aorta like those with diff uh, diffusion tip, but the evidence supporting its use is weak, uh, whether uh, bevel tip or diffusion tip or the uh, wire reinforced one. Many center uses the uh, soft straight uh, cannulas because of its uh, Excellent flow, dynamic, and easy insertion, like uh, what's shown in the picture. For arterial cannulation, uh, it's important to choose an adequate size arterial cannula. And uh, not only important to achieve a good flow, but also it will decrease the risk of uh, dislodging atheromas and uh, it will uh, decrease the risk of. Uh, hemolysis. And the tip of the cannula is the point of maximum pressure of the circuit. And if the pressure there exceeds uh, 100 millimeter mercury above the mean, the risk of hemolysis is significant. Moving to a technique of ascending aorta cannulation, for choosing an appropriate site for uh, intended uh, surgery away from calcific plaques or leaving a space for a cross clamp, proximal anastomosis, and aortotomy in case of uh, LDR, for example, using a double pursing technique to ensure the stability. And uh, we may ask for uh, head down and to, and to lower the systolic blood pressure uh, less than 100 millimeter mercury. And uh, it's important also to clear the adventitia, stabbing 
and inserting the cannula while controlling bleeding by a finger or holding the atrium tissue with the forceps uh, with your assistant. Ensuring intraluminal uh, position by observing a versatile uh, column and to snare and fix the cannula with uh, a heavy tie. And uh, de air and connect the arterial line and ensure intraluminal uh, position again uh, with line pressure confirmed with the uh, perfusionist. Uh, and also sometimes fixing the cannula to the skin is helpful to uh, minimize the tip movement and uh, intimal injury. Uh, some complications might happen during the ascending aortic cannulation, for example, aortic dissection, it can, which can be noted by discoloration of the adventitia or an increase in the airline pressure of more than 300 with a drop in the perfusion pressure. And uh, also the perfusion might alarm you that he is not getting a sufficient uh, venous return. Other complications, atheromatous uh, embolism, air embolism, and uh, accidental uh, decandidation. Also bleeding and tears and malposition can also as well. And uh, it's important to mention that also uh, uh, too much advancement of the uh, cannula might injure the uh, aortic vacuum. Moving to uh, femoral uh, artery cannulation, it's the usually the first choice, as we said, for emergency cannulation in case of severe bleeding in uh, redo cases, pre-op uh, cardiac arrest, intra-op dissection, and post-op severe shock. And uh, it will be elective in cases of minimal uh, invasive cardiac surgery and surgical cut down can be performed with a uh, surgical cut down or percutaneously. And also, uh, uh, important complications might happen with the femoral artery cannulation, like a retrograde uh, dissection uh, and the distal limb ischemia, which can be uh, prevented by putting uh, anti grade uh, cannula, and also tearing and uh, thrombosis and so, uh, pseudoaneurysm and groin hematoma uh, or retrobritinia. Uh, for axillary artery cannulation, it's the preferred over femoral cannulation in cases of aortic dissection repair, as it's uh, free, usually free from atherosclerosis, and it provides integrate flow to the arch vessels and uh, protection from uh, arm ischemia by uh, collaterals. And care must be taken not to injure the uh, brachial plexus. Moving to uh, the uh, venous reservoir, which uh, mainly we have two types of uh, venous reservoir, the rigid one and the soft one. The rigid reservoir or the uh, sometimes called open reservoir, the advantages over the other one, it facilitates the uh, volume measurement and uh, it's uh, easier uh, management of uh, venous air and easier to prime and will have a large capacity. We can uh, provide uh, emergency volume and it's less expensive. The disadvantages over the uh, soft reservoir is the formation of uh, uh, risk of microemboli and the blood elements activation. For the uh, soft or closed reservoir, uh, it's uh, expensive, but it will eliminate the blood gas interface and it will reduce the chance of uh, massive air embolism. Moving to the uh, oxygenator. The principle is that uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide diffuse passively between the blood and gas through a mechanism according to the pressure, uh, pressure uh, differential. So the uh, partial uh, pressure of oxygen is controlled by FiO2 
and partial pressure of uh, CO2 by gas flow of what's called the uh, sweep rate. The uh, membrane oxygenator compared, we have two types actually of uh, oxygenator, the membrane oxygenator and the bubble oxygenator. The uh, advantages of uh, membrane oxygenator over the bubble oxygenator is that it's uh, uh, less particulate and gas imply, uh, less activation of uh, blood elements, and it has uh, a superior uh, control of uh, blood gases. And in some studies, uh, they're claiming that uh, less uh, systemic uh, inflammatory response activation with the membrane oxygenator. But the drawback, it's, uh, it's expensive. The uh, heat exchanger for hypothermia in cardiac surgery. For hypothermia used in cardiac surgery to decrease the oxygen demand and to provide a bloodless field, especially during uh, deep hypothermic uh, cirrhotic arrest. And the perfusive temperature is controlled by passing hot or cold water uh, through uh, coils around the blood in the heat exchanger unit. And the blood should not be heated above 40 uh, degrees to prevent uh, protein denaturation. And the temperature gradient between the brain and the perfusate should never exceed 10, 10 uh, degrees Celsius to prevent formation of air bubbles distant to the uh, arterial filter. Moving to the bumps, we have uh, two main uh, types, the roller bump and the centrifugal bump. For the centrifugal bump, its uh, flow is dependent on the impeller rotation speed, and uh, it depends also on, on the afterload. It generates less negative pressure, so uh, less uh, micro uh, emboli risk. For the roller bump, uh, the flow on such a bump, it depends on the length and the diameter of the tubing and how many uh, round uh, per minute are generated by the roller pump. And the compression of the tube should be nearly occlusive. Uh, this table summarizes the um, advantages and disadvantages of the both, both types of bumps. For the uh, roller bump, uh, it uses a low uh, prime volume, low cost, and no potential uh, for backflow, and uh, sometimes provide a shallow si uh, sine wave pulse around uh, 5 millimeter mercury. For the centrifugal bump, it's a portable position uh, insensitive. It's safe, positive, and negative uh, pressure. It adapts the venous return and it's superior for right or left heart bypass and it's prepared for long-term bypass uh, uh, like uh, ECMO machines and it's protect against massive air embolism. Disadvantages of the uh, roller bump over the centrifugal bump it's, uh, is that uh, it's uh, excessive positive and negative pressure with uh, some spallation might happen tubing uh, might, might rupture, but it's rarely happening, uh, happening with the, the new uh, tubing, the new BVC tubing or the silicon tubing. And the potential for massive air embolism and the necessary of uh, occlusion uh, adjustment, and it requires a close observation and supervision. For a centrifugal bomb disadvantages, it has a large uh, priming uh, volume and it requires a flow meter and it has a potential for a passive uh, backward flow and uh, it's more expensive than the roller bump. Moving to the filter and bubble traps. Uh, the microemboli can be generated from anywhere in the circuit or in open wound. The gaseous or biologic or non-biologic microemboli uh, might be generated. The produ uh, it produces much of the uh, morbidity associated with cardiopulmonary bypass. 
and the largest source of gaseous uh, macro emboli is the cardiotomy reservoir. Other sources, uh, it might be the stopcocks for the uh, pump circuit, sampling ports and injection sites, the priming solution and the uh, uh, procedures, and cavitation pump uh, or our cannula, a low volume venous reservoir. Uh, that's why uh, usually we have a sensor to detect the uh, low volume status in uh, the reservoir or by direct observation. Oxygenator, tear or breaks in the uh, tubes, uh, loose uh, burst ring in, in heart and um, great vessels, and uh, rapid rewarming. And this uh, table summarizes the uh, major sources of microemboli, whether uh, a gas or foreign body or blood uh, based. Uh, microemboli. <clears throat> For prevention and control of microemboli, uh, the perfusionist usually are using a membrane oxygenator instead of uh, the bubble oxygenator and uh, will uh, complement the uh, cardiotomy reservoir with uh, uh, additional filters and by uh, having the arterial line filter. The surgeon uh, should minimize the field suctioning and washing a blood aspirated from the uh, field. Uh, for example, for uh, by using cell saver and appropriate LB venting and de-airing. For perfusion monitors and safety devices, we have uh, usually a backup a heater and cooler, and backup oxygen a supply and emergency lightning, and pre-bypass ACT and uh, ACT during bypass and pre-bypass checklist by the perfusionist, and macro bubble detector with pump cutoff and A-line filter pre-bypass uh, uh, filter and the oxygen supply filter and um, inline venous oxygen saturation and inline arterial oxygen saturation and other uh, parameters and safety checklists. Moving to assembly of cardiopulmonary bypass and priming. So for assembly of cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, we have dry setup. It takes 15 minutes and it lasts for seven days. For the uh, uh, wet setup or prime setup, it takes uh, 15 minutes as well and it will uh, last for seven hours. So uh, what do you mean by priming? It means the filling the circuit with uh, saline or uh, Ringer's lactate to receive a patient uh, blood and to replace his volume when you go on pump. It also helps to test the uh, circuit before and de-air it after uh, before uh, connecting uh, to uh, the patient. And many centers also use uh, carbon dioxide to flush the circuit to decrease the incidence of uh, air bubbles formation. And priming with saline or blood depends on the uh, patient and surgeon preference. And blood is used mainly uh, in pediatric age group or for patients who uh, start with uh, low uh, baseline hemoglobin. So uh, moving to managing uh, hemodilution, the hemodilution uh, should be managed to keep the mixed venous sat above 60% to assure a proper tissue perfusion. A mixed venous sat less than 60% can be fixed by whether transfusion to increase the hematocrit or by increasing the pump flow. Uh, manitol uh, in some cases can be added to the prime to stimulate uh, diuresis and to minimize post renal dysfunction. And to decrease the hemodilution, we use shorter lines, a smaller diameter tubes, decrease the priming volume, and um, sometimes by uh, doing pubbing by autologous uh, blood priming. For hemofiltration, 
the uh, using of semi permeable membrane connected to the arterial line after the bump to generate enough pressure for uh, filtration. Uh, it will remove uh, a water from the uh, perfusate to reduce the hemodilution and it will remove the excess electrolytes and it will drain back into the uh, venous reservoir and it conserves platelets and uh, clotting factors, not like the uh, cell saver. And usually, uh, this is how it, uh, how it uh, looks like and uh, it's connected uh, downwards to the uh, waste bag. Moving to uh, heparinization. Usually heparin uh, augment the antithrombin uh, 3 action by uh, 1,000 folds, and the initial uh, dosage for heparin, usually 3 to 4 milligram per kg, or 300 to 400 units per kg. And uh, it's been, shown, it's been um, proven that bovine heparin is more antigenic than the uh, porcine one. And it's recommended that ACT for cardiopulmonary bypass uh, to keep it around uh, 480 seconds, but uh, 300 seconds is usually safe for cannulation. In case of higher uh, ACT, uh, like uh, more than 1,000 seconds, uh, the risk of remote bleeding will be high. And for low ACT, the risk of uh, thrombosis and clotting will be high. Uh, usually, during cardiopulmonary bypass, we measure ACT every 30 minutes, and one third of the initial dose given uh, every hour to maintain adequate anticoagulation, even if the ACT uh, within the normal range. And this is um, how is the uh, ACT machine looks like. So in case of failure to achieve satisfactory ACT, usually uh, because of inadequate heparin dose or for low uh, antithrombin-3 uh, levels, and the most common cause is previous exposure to heparin, especially a patient kept on heparin infusion for a long time. Uh, for treatment of heparin resistant, we'll give an extra dose, uh, usually uh, for a total of uh, five milligram per kg. <clears throat> And we can replace antithrombin-3 uh, as FFB or uh, recombinant antithrombin-3. It's preferred actually and offer the FFB to avoid transfusion risk. For heparin reversal by protein, usually uh, in one-to-one -one ratio, one milligram of protein to one milligram for the initial dose of heparin, not to exceed three milligram per kg. And after giving a protein, uh, we should not use uh, the cardiotomy suckers anymore. And the heparin uh, protein complex activate the complement uh, pathway. So uh, we have to uh, keep an eye on the blood pressure to avoid hypotension. And uh, this may be avoided by giving uh, extra calcium, two milligram uh, to each uh, one milligram protein. Uh, for initiation of uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, once the uh, cannulating is secured and anticoagulation is adequate to start the cardiopulmonary bypass, while initiating the bump, you have to observe six things. Uh, you have to have adequate uh, venous drainage for the desired flow, and you have to have a decompressed heart. Uh, adequate uh, airline pressure and airline uh, oxygen saturation and systemic arterial pressure and a good systemic venous uh, pressure as well. Once uh, full uh, flow, wait for uh, usually ten min uh, uh, two minutes and then uh, we'll uh, discontinue the uh, ventilation and we'll start cooling down and uh, later we'll apply the cross clamp. So uh, what we'll do if the uh, perfusionist uh, ask or uh, alarm you that we have a low uh, venous drainage. So from the uh, surgeon side, we have uh, to choose 
uh, adequate size cannula from the beginning. And we have to uh, make sure that appropriate uh, positioning uh, has been uh, secured and uh, to ensure that there is no kink or uh, airlocks in the tubes and to ensure that there is no unnoticed external bleeding, especially in the uh, pleura. Uh, from the uh, perfusionist side, uh, he has to uh, ensure the height differential between the patient and the pump at least uh, 40 centimeters. 40 to 70 centimeter for adequate uh, siphoning. And for assisted venous drainage system, for example, uh, the pump or the vacuum assisted uh, drainage, though it has a risk of uh, microembolism and hemolysis as we discussed. And uh, from the anesthesia side, uh, increasing the CVB by fluids or blood or by decreasing the venous uh, tone by uh, medications. For arresting the heart, uh, anti-grade cardioplegia started with a pressure of uh, 60 to 100 millimeter mercury for adequate coronary delivery. So how to determine that we have uh, a sufficient uh, cardioplegia? Usually, uh, by the amount of cardioplegia, the arrest will uh, happen uh, with the first uh, 100 ml induced and will notice a cessation of uh, electrical activity and the arrest time with integrate technique usually within 30 to 60 seconds. <clears throat> For failure to arrest with integrate, we um, have to check problems with the cardioplegia solution itself and uh, with the delivery and when uh, we have unrecognized uh, AI, and if we have a loose uh, cross clamp. For retrograde cardioplegia, uh, we'll have an incomplete uh, protection of the RT for sure, but for the adequate ret uh, retrograde cardioplegia parameters, usually the pressure will be kept we should be kept around uh, 20 to 40 millimeter mercury and the flow around 200 to 400 uh, milliliter per minute and with delayed rest time usually after two to four minutes. Having a high pressure will put you at a high risk of uh, injuring the coronary sinus and low pressure uh, when we have insufficient delivery, it may be uh, caused by coronary sinus tear or rupture or malposition for the cannula or leakage around the balloon or loose uh, the string. And for the uh, cardioplegia delivery system, we have a line for the cardioplegia solution itself, line for the uh, blood coming from the oxygenator and bump for each line and the cooler and the heater uh, unit filter and pressure transducer and line to the patient. <clears throat> Moving to uh, venting uh, the heart, usually the uh, myocardial oxygen demand depends on base, basal and metabolic rate, contractility, heart rate, and the wall tension. And the wall tension can be uh, calculated by the uh, pressure multiplied by the radius over two times the wall thickness so without appropriate venting, the arrested heart may uh, fit and distend more. This will increase both the radius and the pressure. And for increased LV wall tension and oxygen demand, this will cause ischemic injury or a reversible injury due to a myofibril disruption. And RB uh, is a volume uh, chamber, as we know, and the distension is rarely a problematic. For uh, venting the heart, the source of blood return uh, to the left heart. It may be uh, from blood escaping around the venous cannula or coronary sinus and epithelium veins and uh, bronchial blood as well. And if we have an aortic, at least mild aortic uh, recurve and no coronary uh, collaterals.
So, uh, what are the sites for LP venting? Usually, uh, the uh, right superior pulmonary vein, we can put it through the left atrial appendage or uh, by passing the uh, vent through a retrograde through the aortic valve. Or we can utilize the pulmonary artery and rarely LV apex. It's useful for emergency venting when cross clamp cannot be applied. So what are the uh, perfusion parameters that we have to uh, keep an eye on it? Uh, safe organ perfusion during cardiopulmonary bypass it depends mainly on flow rate, the arterial pressure, hematocrit, and temperature. And the accepted uh, flow rate indexed is 2.2 to 2.4 uh, liter per minute per meter square. This is the index flow, not the uh, full flow. The average size, uh, it is for the average size adult at 35 to 37 degrees Celsius, and for a hematocrit of uh, around uh, 20 to 25 percent, and for uh, deeply anesthetized and uh, muscle relaxed patient. Uh, what is the um, flow rate temperature uh, relationship? Usually, the hemodilution it will decrease the oxygen content from uh, 20 milliliter per deciliter to uh, 10. So it's around 50% uh, reduction. To uh, compensate for this, uh, we have to increase the uh, flow and decrease the oxygen demand by hypothermia. Usually for each uh, one degree decrease in temperature, the required pump flow index is reduced by 7%. So for acceptable flow rate at different temperature to keep 85 of maximum oxygen consumption level at 30 degree, uh, 1.8 uh, liter per minute per uh, meter square, at 25, 1.6 at 18, uh, one liter index flow. So the, uh, for the uh, hypothermia and the relation with the oxygen consumption, Usually, the hypothermia decreases the basal metabolic, metabolic rate, and uh, so the lower temperature you go on, the lower oxygen consumption, and hence the flow you need to meet the uh, body uh, energy uh, requirement. So, uh, for MAP and organ uh, perfusion, brain perfusion depends uh, on mainly. Uh, the map. So to keep map of uh, around uh, 60 millimeter mercury, uh, this will keep uh, its perfusion uh, by uh, autoregulation. Now, what do I mean by autoregulation? Is uh, that as long as the uh, pressure is within the autoregulatory uh, range, the organ will control its flow by the um, uh, independent autoregulatory mechanism of how much flow you are giving as long as uh, this uh, flow can generate the lowest uh, limit. And for sure, for an elderly uh, patient with multiple comorbidities, uh, we need uh, a higher uh, uh, map, usually around uh, or above uh, 70 millimeter mercury. And the higher pressures, it will increase the collateral flow to the feet. Other organs, it depends mainly on the uh, flow index. So if the systemic flow reduced, the first organs will be affected by order, usually the uh, skeletal muscle and abdominal uh, viscera and bowel and the kidney. For hypothermia, the advantage of cooling, it protects the brain and uh, increase the safety of uh, circuit rest. It protects the heart uh, to maintain hypothermic uh, cardioplegia, and it protects the body to maintain a perfusion at a lower flow and at a lower uh, hematocrit level. The disadvantages of uh, cooling, it decreases the enzyme function, decreases the coagulation, it decreases the organ function, and it increases the uh, cardiac recovery time. 
the uh, uh, systemic vascular resistance and the cardiopulmonary diapastine and increases the risk of cerebral hyperthermia and air embolism and it will increase the post-op depression and uh, anxiety. Usually the brain temperature uh, might be underestimated by the standard temperature monitoring, uh, which is the nasopharyngeal probes by three to five uh, degrees Celsius. Uh, so uh, several uh, proposed strategies for reducing the cerebral hyperthermia during the warming is that um, uh, temperature of 34 to the warm, uh, to the uh, level of temperature of 34, usually it's associated with fewer uh, cognitive uh, deficit one week and three months after cabbage uh, in an observational studies compared with uh, rewarming to uh, 37 to avoid this um, uh, underestimation with the nasopharyngeal uh, temperature monitoring. Moving to uh, glucose management during cardiopulmonary bypass, we have to uh, maintain a tight glycemic control in cardiopulmonary bypass, usually around 140 to 180 milligram per deciliter. This uh, will decrease the incidence of infection, neurological injury, renal injury, cardiac complications, and ICU length of stay, and the overall mortality as well. Uh, for temperature monitoring, uh, we have different uh, modalities that we can uh, uh, use for bladder or rectal uh, monitoring, usually for the body mass temperature and not for the brain, and for the esophageal and pulmonary artery, usually it's affected by local uh, uh, cooling and cardioplegia administration. For jugular venous bulb, it's the best actually for the brain temperature, but it's difficult uh, to obtain. And for the nasopharyngeal or tympanic, uh, which is uh, more commonly used to assess the uh, brain temperature, and it underestimates the jugular venous uh, bulb during the warming by three to five uh, degrees, as we discussed. For neurophysiological monitoring, uh, Using a jugular venous bulb temperature and uh, uh, venous set, uh, transcranial cranial, uh, Doppler ultrasound might be used as well, and using a nurse and EEG. Clinical benefit not yet established for routine cardiopulmonary bypass, and it's more commonly used for a deep hypothermic uh, circ arrest. And this is how, how the uh, uh, nurse uh, looks like, near infrared uh, spectroscopy. To monitor the uh, brain uh, oxygenation. For body uh, perfusion uh, monitoring, it depends on adequate delivery and consumption uh, of oxygen. So the mixed venous set, it assists the relationship uh, between delivery and consumption, and for mixed venous sat less than 60%, it indicates inadequate oxygen delivery, and for higher uh, mixed venous sat, it does not assure adequate oxygen delivery due to different uh, uh, regional uh, hypoperfusion. So the uh, Body perfusion monitoring, we can uh, uh, utilize uh, the uh, lactate level and uh, the elevated levels indicate inadequate oxygen delivery and even with normal uh, venous sat. And uh, urine output, it's a good indicator actually uh, for reassuring but does not ensure a good uh, perfusion. So urine output might be affected by uh, perfusion pressure, absence of pulse style flow, the temperature, adding uh, diuresis and the prime content, content uh, itself, and by hematocrit and viscosity. Uh, moving finally to uh, weaning from cardiopulmonary bypass, it's a gradual process uh, to uh, withdraw the uh, uh, bypass as the heart takes over the circulation. 
So a difficult weaning from, from cardiopulmonary bypass can be anticipated before uh, the uh, beginning of the surgery in case of severe LV dysfunction, RV dysfunction, severe pulmonary hypertension or acute uh, MR or recent uh, STEMI. Uh, the anticipation of difficult weaning is crucial. So uh, means of mechanical uh, circulatory support should be uh, prepared, uh, like uh, the use of ventral aortic balloon pump or ECMO, for example. Weaning uh, is a combined task from the surgeon side, anesthesiologist, and the perfusionist. The surgeon uh, direct the actions of the team depending on the uh, stability of the patient, hemodynamics, and other physiological uh, parameters. So before uh, we start weaning, we have to check and manage the following uh, parameters. Uh, from the uh, uh, surgical side, the anastomosis and the suture line uh, hemostasis, and the airing, for other uh, physiological uh, parameters, we have the temperature, electrolytes, hemoglobin, uh, blood gases, sugar, urine output. And for hemodynamics, we have uh, to ensure a good um, contractility and uh, rates and rhythm as well. For rewarming, uh, usually it started uh, before the conclusion of surgery, commonly with the last anastomosis in case of cabbage, for example, or before cavity uh, closure of an open heart procedure. We can uh, utilize the uh, vasodilator therapy if uh, uh, tolerated. This may uh, improve uh, homogeneous rewarming and increases the venous capacitance to accommodate uh, the circuit uh, volume. And uh, usually you have a perfusion temperature uh, maximum is the uh, is around 37 degrees Celsius, and the patient perfusion temperature maximum gradient is around uh, 10 uh, degree, and temperature above 35 or 34 is acceptable uh, to come uh, of bypass. Uh, for uh, de airing, usually starts before removing the uh, cross clamp after open heart. So before the final uh, closing uh, stitches, air is removed by reducing the venous uh, drain and the heart is uh, cautiously massaged to displace uh, the trapped air. And the closure is completed with a gentle venting and with the uh, head down and aortic clamp uh, removed. For the airing after removal of cross clamp, we can uh, ask to keep the patient and uh, with the uh, head down position and uh, sometimes with the little uh, left tilt to displace the air, uh, the apex anteriorly. And air, we can detect it by uh, intra TE and suctioned by the uh, vents. And the intra air in the pulmonary vasculature and cavity is displaced by the Palzalpa maneuver, asking the anesthesiologist, and sometimes by shaking and massaging. So uh, for uh, weaning electrolytes, uh, blood gases, and pH, our target passing around uh, 4.5 to 5, it decreases the incidence of uh, arrhythmia. Uh, you have to watch the uh, lactate level to keep the hemoglobin around uh, 8 to 10, blood sugar 140 to 180, and um, ensure uh, adequate urine output. For uh, contractility, usually uh, we can assess it by direct inspection and by the uh, transesophageal echo. For regional abnormality, it may be uh, due to uh, air embolism or graft spasm or incomplete revascularization in case of uh, cabbage. Or global hypokinesia uh, may be due to inadequate uh, myocardial protection, reperfusion injury, or metabolic acidosis. 
uh, treated initially with inotropic support, correcting uh, any reversible causes, and finally, we move to uh, mechanical support if we fail the previous strategies. For the rhythm, it should be sinus. Uh, junctional rhythm may be acceptable if uh, at uh, acceptable rate, no uh, bradycardia. And the causes and management of arrhythmia during uh, weaning, uh, defibrillation first with the biphasic paddles of uh, 5 to uh, 20, and simultaneously look for causes. Check for and correct hyperkalemia. Uh, usually, hypomagnesemia can be corrected uh, empirically. And coronary acidosis uh, by giving uh, sometimes a uh, hot shot to uh, act as a buffer to wash out these uh, uh, metabolites. For causes and management of uh, arrhythmia during a weaning, uh, in case of coronary air embolism, usually it's treated by increasing the coronary perfusion pressure and by keeping a pulse of flow, by partially clamping the venous line and let the heart eject. For ischemic VF, especially in case of LVH, such as in severe AS cases, lidocaine works best for ischemic VF, and amidron and magnesium can be added for persistent VF. And uh, uh, if the rate showing uh, bradycardia usually uh, transient, but uh, may be caused uh, by uh, pre abuse of a beta blocker uh, or uh, RCA having an RCA lesion or uh, any uh, nodal injury during the procedure, and it's treated by atropine or beta agonist or a failed uh, temporary uh, pacemaker. After ensuring all uh, the mentioned parameters is satisfactory, the uh, surgeon will ask the perfusionist to reduce the pump flow and fill the heart gradually, and will ask the anesthesiologist to uh, resume ventilation. So at least a 300 ml is kept in the reservoir for volume resuscitation in case of emergency, uh, for example, uh, protein reaction. And the extra volume is available uh, from the tubes, usually around 300 ml, and from oxygenator around uh, 250 to 350 ml. And while coming off, we have to monitor uh, adequate uh, rate and rhythm, adequate uh, pressure, and uh, pulse waveform, and uh, inspecting RV for filling and the central venous pressure. To confirm a satisfactory native uh, circulation and ventilation, uh, ensure that we have uh, good pulse oximetry, saturation around 100%, with inside the CO2 more than 25 millimeter mercury, and mixed venous fat above uh, 65. When cardiac performance is satisfactory and stable for a few minutes, then we can start removing vents and uh, secure it, and we'll start by removing a uh, venous cannula, but we'll keep the snare initially for emergency volume resuscitation, and then we'll remove the aortic cannula and secu uh, secure it. Uh, we'll give protamin and we'll discontinue the uh, pump suckers. Uh, this was the uh, end of my talk, and uh, thanks for listening. Any comments or uh, question? Thank you very much, Dr. Khalid, for this uh, excellent lecture. Uh, the floor is open now for uh, any comments or question. يعطيك العافية خالد. Okay, so if uh, if there is no questions or uh, comments, 
Uh, I think we can have a 10 minute break and uh, we'll come at uh, 2.15 and uh, we will start with the next uh, lecture with Dr. Noaf Lamy, pitfalls uh, and management during cardiopulmonary bypass. Hello, السلام عليكم. Good عليكم السلام ورحمة الله. يا هلا دكتور. Can I share my screen? Yes, please. Prepare my slide. Thank you. Yes, please. Go ahead. Hello? Hello?
Hello. Ana. Yes, shall we start? Whenever you are ready, please. So, Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is No Family, cardiac surgery resident from Medina Cardiac Center. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, cardiovascular bypass pitfalls and management. Hopefully, we can make this session interactive as much as we can. So our outlines is uh, establishing access for uh, bypass, in initiating and maintaining of bypass, and uh, going through pitfalls that arise in each of these steps. So first of all, uh, any patient that requires uh, bypass uh, needed procedure need a comprehensive systemic based uh, history and physical examination to identify the history of stroke, renal diseases, uh, intestinal angina, uh, respiratory problems, bleeding disorders, or uh, peripheral vascular diseases. So for tests, basically labs as CBC, BNP, coagulation profiles, LFTs, and renal function, uh, hit CT in case of recent stroke, uh, carotid duplex in case of stroke or bruise, or even in case of uh, uh, lift main uh, stenosis. Uh, mesenteric duplex, if there is any evidence of int uh, intestinal ischemia. And uh, coronary, an coronary angio to identify critical lesions. Uh, pulmonary function test for uh, history of respiratory problems, COPD or smoker patient, and chest CT in case of patient has uh, aberrant calcification in their chest uh, x-rays. So our first uh, case scenario, you are uh, starting a mitral valve repair case and ask the anesthesiologist to give heparin. Then you ask your perfusionist if the ACT is safe and adequate to, to start your cannulation and bypass. Uh, he responds that he is having trouble and uh, tells you that standard dose of heparin has been given, but the ACT is only 200 seconds and it's not going up. How would you deal with this issue? What comes in your mind? Anyone? Uh, heparin resistance. Heparin resistance. Okay. Why? What's okay. First, uh, well, I, I need to make sure that the, uh, that the anesthesiologist has given uh, adequate dose of heparin. They gave uh, their ensured dose of heparin. Yeah. Then the lack of response uh, ev uh, evident by the suboptimal ACT, I think it uh, may indicate uh, heparin resistance. What is heparin resistant? What's, what will cause heparin resistant? What, what comes in your mind that heparin is not causing the ACT to boost up? Uh, isn't it due to low level of antithrombin? True, antithrombin. Mm. Okay. In which cases you will consider antithrombin uh, three levels are low? Do you I'm have any sure. idea? No. Okay, perfect. So, so in this case, first with anticoagulation, inadequate ACT, mostly uh, it's uh, indicated for antithrombin three deficiency that result in resistance uh, to the treatment of heparin. And this mostly uh, and frequently uh, happens with patients who were maintained preoperatively on uh, heparin therapy or IV nitroglycerin or those even with high platelet count that, that's more than 300,000. So in this case, uh, what we will do? Simply, we will ask the uh, anesthetist if they can administer more dose of heparin. Usually it will achieve an adequate ACT, if not, uh, antithrombin can be provided by transfusion of FFP or, if available, by a commercial uh, anti uh, antithrombin uh, 3 product like Trobat 3. Okay. In case of HET, uh, what would you do if patient is known 
to have hit or confirm to be operatively that he is a hit case. Anyone? It's written, but come on. You can't change the heparin to bevaterdine because it's risk for hip. So. That's one option, but not always. When you will uh, choose to alternate heparin with uh, other anticoagulants, you'll go straight to change heparin to uh, an alternative anticoagulant with any case. What is HET? It's heparin-induced uh, thrombocytopenia. Okay. How many and types of HET you know? There are two types. Perfect. Uh, there is the autoimmune type, and there yeah. is the one caused because of a side effect of heparin. Okay. The type one is the one which is a side effect of heparin, causes mild uh, thrombocyto, uh, low thrombocyte count. And type two is the autoimmune. If I'm not mistaken. What is the, the more issue for us? The more problematic? Uh, the, the, the autoimmune, uh, the autoimmune, which is can cause uh, generalized Why? thrombosis. Perfect, because uh, HIT type two mm. is uh, the development of heparin and platelet factor four complex antibodies, which is thrombogenic. Yes. That uh, bind to uh, platelet aggregate uh, and trigger aggregation and arterial and venous thrombosis. Perfect, excellent. Yes. Okay. In this case, if you have an elective case, what would you do? Usually, the antibody is clear. The patient is hit. Usually, the antibody is clear uh, by like a couple of months. Then you can uh, make sure before the surgery that the patient has no anti uh, hit antibodies. If he has yeah. no antibodies against the plate, uh, heparin, the platelet factor for complex, then you can go through for the surgery with the, with heparin. But if it's an urgent surgery, you have to use uh, bivalurudine. You may consider alternative anti oh, yes. uh, anticoagulation. Sorry, so perfect. So in case of elective surgery, you may postpone the uh, elective procedure up to two to three months. Antibodies usually are cleared less than three months. And in case of urgent or emergency basis cases, uh, and the confirmed uh, case of acute or subacute uh, HET is present, uh, the use of unfractionated heparin is that may increase the risk of rapid onset of HET. So you rather alternate anticoagulation and use uh, either bevalurudine, hilirudine, or uh, tylosaban. Okay, furthermore, now in the step of cannulation, you need to keep these steps uh, in your mind. First, you have to palpate your uh, ascending aorta for any calcification. Not only the site of your cannulation, you have to go through all your ascending aorta. Second, you have to ensure you are high enough in your cannulation site to uh, give more space for cross clamp and to allow uh, uh, to complete your proximal procedure, either aortotomy for uh, aortic uh, valve procedure or for uh, proximal anastomosis. Then you have to uh, make sure you are adequately anticoagulated with ACT uh, 400 plus. Then you will place your repair string, check uh, for your systemic pressure to be low uh, with the maintained main uh, blood pressure, ideally from less than 70, but not less than uh, 65. And then you will cannulate your aorta. Usually uh, you will choose the size of uh, 21 or 24 French and secure your cannula. How would you secure your cannula in place? Anyone? It was first string. Mm, okay. First string and snaring the, the area. Any other answers? It was just mentioned in the lecture with, by Dr. Khalid. Uh, can I answer? Yes, sure. Uh, what I usually see in the OR, you snare it with the, you have three. Uh, uh, three things you do to, to secure the uh, arterial cannula. You have two mm -hmm. purse strings around the aortotomy site. Mm -hmm. this, this you have to snare, and then you use a silk tie to tie both snares to the cannula. 
And then we do also in the OR, we take an extra silk stitch, we suture it to the patient uh, upper sternal wound, to the upper edge of the sternal wound. Okay. Good, good enough. Uh, so snares will not hold your cannula in place. It will not secure your cannula in place. It will only prevent leaking around your cannula. Okay. The, the uh, tie you take around your cannula and your snuggers is the one which will secure your cannula in place and prevent dislodgement of your cannula. Okay. And for more securing, you will fix it with another tie on the skin or elsewhere. Okay. So after that, you need to... Uh, Dr. Anaf, one comment regarding yes. this. Uh, there is two techniques to secure the cannula. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the tying both snares around the cannula uh, or uh, tying one snare uh, around the cannula. Um, yes. There is um, no, uh, there is no like evidence of uh, which one is better, but uh, what uh, different surgeons uh, believe that uh, securing um, one uh, snare around the cannula will cause, uh, sorry, one tie around the cannula uh, will cause the tie to, uh, to be um, directly over the cannula, um, making it more secure compared to putting the tie uh, over the snares. Um, if, in case if your uh, tie is not uh, really uh, tight, uh, the, the cannula can slip through the snares because and if you can imagine, yeah. the tie is around the snares, not around the cannula. But uh, in practice, uh, I've seen different surgeons uh, using both technique and uh, so far. I think uh, it's a uh, matter of preference. Yeah, but so far I saw uh, one case of uh, dislodgement of the aortic cannula and uh, it was uh, with the usual uh, tie around the uh, two snares. Two snares. So, okay. so yeah, maybe that one is better. I'm not sure. But uh, I, uh, I thought you should know about this. Okay, thank you, Dr. Matova. Mm. So next, going to test your line pressure uh, as uh, after hooking the, uh, the cannula to the arterial line, you will open the line and ask your perfusionist to transfuse and you will visual, uh, visualize the line for uh, swing and the, the proximal aorta for, to test for uh, the perfusion if there is no swelling of the aorta and uh, you will check for pressure which is cor correlating with the systemic pressure. And then you will cannulate your venous uh, cannula either direct RA uh, cannula to uh, dual stage to uh, drain both uh, RA and IVC or in case of intracardiac procedure go for selective bicaval cannulation. I have one question, please. Yes, please. Um, regarding testing the line pressure, the arterial line pressure, do you need to transfuse uh, either uh, the prime solution or blood through the cannula to test the pressure? Yes, sure. Can, can we, can't we just test the pressure on the line without uh, uh, infusing? Because I think uh, infusing uh, uh, so any solution, whether blood or prime, prime, if the cannula is against the wall, might be dangerous, especially on, with high pressures. But you wouldn't know this if you don't transfuse. If you nope. start, if you resume your uh, bypass and mm. there is a defect in your cannula, either it's dissecting the aorta or it's against the uh, posterior wall, this will cause more trouble. That's why you, you will test your line. You can test the line if the pressure is damped because there is a continuous column inside the line all the way to the bypass machine. If the line, I think, is damped, that means you are against the wall or if it's low, maybe you are in one of the branches. Uh, um, I'm... Professor, if you allow me to answer your question. Yes. Uh, actually, actually, both of uh, what's mentioned is, uh, is being done. Maybe it's done by the perfusionist uh, without you knowing about it. Um, they usually, the first they test the pressure only before giving any transfusion. So he, yeah. he's just looking at his uh, arterial line of pressure and comparing yes. it to the uh, to the systemic pressure. If it's acceptable within twenty and there is there is no much of difference, mm -hmm. uh, then he will do the uh, the uh, volume test. Yeah, that's what so I it, thought. First, you have to is, check. This is what they done because if you mm -hmm. check the pressure and as you said, if it's like 
uh, too too high, too much of a difference between the arterial line and the systemic pressure, uh, he would not test because you might uh, actually dissect it already and you are on a wall, so he will have a, a very high line of pressure. Or if it's already obstructed, the tip is, is, is obstructed because it's uh, touching the posterior wall or for, or for any reason. So he will first test the pressure. If the pressure is acceptable, then he will give the, uh, the volume. Some surgeons, some surgeons, some uh, surgeons I work with, uh, they uh, they communicate with the perfusionist all the time, and uh, in this point of uh, of, of the surgery, uh, they direct the 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 perfusionist uh, in doing this test. So he would say, uh, after he put the after he connect his line and remove the uh, the clamp, he will say, "What's your pressure?" And after he knows what's the pressure, then he will ask him to do uh, to give the test or give the volume. I see. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Michael. So the ABCs for this test is first anticoagulation to ensure you are adequately anticoagulated. You need to uh, make sure you are uh, high enough for your cross clamp and uh, C for the bulbation of calcification. So furthermore, uh, to initiate your uh, bypass, as we mentioned before, check your ACT, make sure it's uh, 480 plus, safely to go for, uh, uh, to go on pump. Uh, to start on pump, you have to forward the flow to initiate and ensure there is no obstruction or high pressure line. And uh, then you will start draining the heart once the forward flow is confirmed. And you will ask the anesthetist to hold ventilation and start flushing plesia, specify your desired temperature and complete any required dissection on the coronary to specify your site of anastomosis prior to cross clamp and arrest. The ABC of this step is uh, first ACT, uh, make sure you are probably anticoagulated. Breathing to hold ventilation and circulation to ensure good forward forward flow and uh, proper drainage with the pulmonary pressure and CVP should be low. So now soon after going on bypass, the perfusionist uh, alerts you that uh, there is a high aortic line pressure. Uh, what is your checklist for this situation? What, you check for any kink, uh, kink first, any kink in the cannula. Okay. And uh, uh, you check the cannula itself uh, from uh, from the aorta. Is there any? It's 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 um, it's position, the uh, the cannula itself. And uh, oh. and then after that, you you think about the dissection and so on. So first you think about uh, mechanical obstruction, kink or clamp on the lines or whatsoever. Then you will check your cannula position if it's malpositioned or uh, in the hour uh, type. So. I need to interrupt you here. So yes. when you go through a checklist for uh, such a, a major thing, you should start with the uh, major, uh, uh, major complications or uh, potential complication before going to the other things. So uh, if uh, whenever the perfusionist tells you that I have a high perfusion pressure, first you will look at your uh, your uh, your um, systemic pressure and uh, your venous line. Make sure that you don't have a dissection. If the pressure, mm -hmm. pressure if your systemic pressure is fine and uh, and the uh, venous uh, drainage is okay, then you can uh, look for the for other things like uh, whatever the other things you mentioned. Okay. So, okay. so my, my message is that keep the the uh, major uh, stuff, the uh, yeah, stuff and then the top of your mind. Yes. And then think about the other smaller issues. Oh. So first you will inspect your aorta to check if uh, there is any sign of dissection, either uh, swelling aorta or discoloration. And uh, make sure you are in proper size of uh, the cannula. So in case of iatrogenic aortic dissection, uh, it occurs in 0.01 uh, to 0.09% of all ascending aortic uh, cannulation. Risk factor uh, in case of dilated ascending aorta, atherosclerotic diseases, uh, 
elderly patient and <clears throat> high blood pressure at the time of cannulation. So you need to visualize your aortic root, uh, look for any distension or discoloration, and immediately ask the anesthetist to, to perform a TEE, even if you suspect a simple hematoma. That can uh, uh, demonstrate uh, any intimal tear or ascending aorta uh, at the side of uh, the ascending aortic cannulation. And uh, if there is any dissection flap that may extend proximally or distally. So in this case, uh, what should you do first? If you confirm there is an, or suspecting either there is an iatrogenic aortic dissection. Can I suggest something, Trino? Yes, please. Your questions is very important and this discussion is uh, very nice. But uh, if you put the answer in front of us, there's like uh, no point. So if you can uh, read the okay. question and uh, before uh, putting the answer. No. Thank you. Thank you. So you suspected an iatrogenic aortic dissection. What is the first thing you should do? Okay, so it's nobody. Uh, Anyone uh, want to? Yeah, further, further. Uh, uh, if I'm gonna, if the dissection happened while I'm doing the central, I've, I saw this once in a video. If you are putting the central, uh, doing central cannulation, you are putting the aortic cannula, and then you start to suspect there is uh, an aortic dissection, uh, I think you should push the aortic cannula even a little bit deeper. And uh, if you are on pump, you have to lower the flow and uh, prepare the femoral or the axillary for peripheral cannulation. And once you confirm there is a dissection and you are sure, you have to convert your procedure to a pintal procedure. Okay, so once you, are, uh, you have a high suspicion of an aortic dissection, you should not, uh, you should not continue with the same uh, cannulation site. So you have to immediately if, if anyone asks you, especially in an exam, the first thing you have to say in such a situation is to say, I have to ask for help. So you would ask for help to call your colleagues and uh, inform everybody in the room, I am suspecting that I have a dissection. So everybody is prepared because now the, you are in a simple cabbage and now the situation uh, has uh, changed to something else. So you have to inform every, call for help and inform everybody and stop the pump. Stop the pump. And then you have to uh, decannulate your uh, your uh, your uh, cannula and uh, secure the uh, bare string uh, while your assistant is preparing the groin for uh, femoral emergency femoral cannulation. What and if the heart is arrested? Well, even though you are you are doing this in a in a in a in a, in a circulatory arrest, so you have to do this. This has been this has to be done in, in a matter of minutes. So you are doing these things uh, in the top and your assistant is already uh, preparing the groin and it should not take uh, more than a few minutes to open emergently. You will just incise the groin and uh, under vision, uh, put, the, uh, put, the another, put another aortic or arterial cannula there and uh, connect uh, the air and connect and start retrograde perfusion because you have two major things to keep in your mind. One is uh, stopping the uh, ongoing dissection, and you will do that by stopping the bump and decannulating. The second thing is to resume uh, perfusion by doing the emergency femoral cannulation. And can, then- Can't, I, can't yeah. I continue the bypass with a low flow after no. pushing the arterial cannula no, a little bit there is, inside? There is no point of, uh, of uh, continuing your flow in a, in, a, in a dissection because you are not perfusing anything. If your cannula is already in the false lumen, that means it's not in the lumen. False lumen the, is something outside the circulation. And but you the are DEE cannot help me locate the uh, cannula the DEE exactly. Will, the DEE will take time. Pushing the cannula is risky and it's not mentioned in, in, in anywhere and it doesn't make real, any real sense. Um, I I respect your uh, your uh, your uh, opinion and uh, whatever video you saw, you saw, and I respect your interaction. But uh, usually, this is the right answer. 
So uh, you call for help for help uh, immediately inform everyone in the room and uh, stop the pump, uh, change the cannula site and uh, start retrograde perfusion. And once you are in a retrograde perfusion, you can then um, uh, cross clamp the, uh, the aorta high and uh, open it and inspect for, it for uh, dissection and repair. And uh, then it will change to another surgery. But what you have to say in the exam is like this. And it's not for the exam, the even for, your, for, for you and your practice. Yes. Is replacing the uh, sending aorta indicated? This is this is, another, this is a lecture by itself. So yeah. it depends. But yeah, the safest answer is to do uh, an ascending aortic replacement. But we are talking now about aortic dissection, which has, you know, it's, uh, it has its okay. own management options and other uh, issues. Okay, clear? Yes, thank you. Thank you. So furthermore, this is the second scenario. You are in a mitral valve case and it's ongoing. Your uh, perfusionist now tells you there is a drop in venous return and the drop in the venous reservoir volume after snaring the cable caps. Uh, the uh, right atrial is not uh, distended, the CVP is elevated, and your uh, perfusionist lowers the uh, bypass flow to protect the level of uh, the reservoir. What are some of the maneuvers uh, to manage inadequate venous drainage? What, what did you suspect the cause? for this inadequate drainage and how to manage it. Maybe the cannula is too deep or uh, the venous cannula, you have to reposition it. Okay. That's why I have a uh, poor venous drainage. Okay. Another thing I can think of is if there is chattering, maybe uh, the venous drainage is too fast or the patient is dehydrated. So I have to fill the patient or uh, make sure the cannula is clamped a little bit. Okay. Um, I have to check the venous cannula itself for any kinks. And? Uh, and maybe the reservoir, I can uh, lower it a little bit more. So the siphonage if can be are, even yeah. better. If you're uh, depending on gravity. Yes. Okay. Uh, oh, it's very hard to, uh, practically very hard to lower the, the uh, yeah, uh, as usual. You can raise people. the patient. Yeah, good, very good. And because usually, usually the perfusionist will put it as low as possible. Yeah, you're right. Continue, please. Continue. I cannot think actually of any other uh, reasons. Uh, maybe if it's dual stage, maybe the cannulas are not snared very well. That also can affect uh, the drainage. But your uh, right atrium is empty, isn't it? Sorry, not dual stage, single stage, like uh, one in the SVC and one in the IVC. Okay, but this is a selective by cable. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I cannot think of other re okay, other perfect. causes. Okay, very good. Thank you. Maybe uh, it's also and also look for airlocks and uh, you can uh, use yeah, this, uh, this one yes. Uh, and you can uh, and in, uh, in most cases you can just uh, uh, put some uh, vacuum. But uh, how would you deal with airlocks? Is it as an emer as an emergency thing, as a uh, bubble in the art arterial cannula, or uh, anything, is it something? Anything that affects perfusion is an emergency because you know, airlock. Then you know you cannot perfuse. If you have an airlock, you, you don't have uh, any blood to return to the pump to give it to the patient. But for the venous so cannula, do you need to clamp it? Or yeah, and control the source of airlock in the venous cannula and try to flush the air into the reservoir. Mm -hmm. you, you do it, you, yeah, I mean, do you remove the, uh, the bubble that is causing the lock or the air trapped there by manipulating the cannula until it's in the reservoir or there are yeah. other maneuvers? This is usually what is done. You can just uh, chase the air uh, upward and then toward the venous reservoir. And... Mm. Uh, there's uh, another other maneuver I read about it, but I never seen it. Uh, like mm. uh, you have, uh, if you have uh, um, an airlock in one side of the bicaval cannulation, 
you can uh, clamp the other side so uh, the venous uh, uh, the, the venous um, volume the venous blood volume uh, will will raise up and it will raise the venous volume from the other side and it will help you to push the the the, the airlock uh, retrogradely toward uh, toward the reservoir i see uh, am i clear That's yes clear. Okay. And also, can I add something? Uh, okay. Sometimes when the when you first uh, cannulate uh, uh, selectively with a single stage cannulas in the IBC and SBC, uh, mm -hmm. first before you don't unclamp both cannula, you have to clamp the first and make sure it's draining, and then you clamp the second. Because if you clamp both at the same time and you have a problem, then you have to look at where is the problem exactly. That's a uh, Uh, yeah, the, if you remove the, the, remove the tube clamp, yes, you have exactly. to remove each cannula separately. So at least you make uh, the problem solving process easier. You will know which cannula is not working. This is, this is one of the safety measures uh, most surgeons do. Exactly. You, you remove one by one to make sure that uh, each one is, uh, is training okay, properly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so in case of inadequate venous drainage, it's mostly detected by the surgeon if there is a, a distension in the RV and the, by the, the surgeons, as I mentioned, that they will alert you there is a drop in the blood level in the venous reservoir. Mostly, you need to check for airlocks, ensure a good position of the venous cannula, uh, elevate the level of the patient uh, in uh, relation to the reservoir if you are relying on gravity. You may add uh, suction drainage uh, as vacuum and increase uh, or go upsize with the cannula size if it's improper. And you may reduce your flow as long as still with an ideal map range. And you need to exclude other sources of blood flow into the heart, especially in the setting of distension of the uh, heart chamber. For example, in case of uh, moderate sphere aortic gears, you may consider LV vent. Or in case of uh, azygous vein, you need to adjust the cannula. And uh, in case of uh, persistent left-sided SVC, you may need you you may need to snare it or directly cannulate it. Last, you need to consider other sites of volume loss. Uh, for example, retroperitoneal or peritoneal hemorrhage. You need to check for abdominal girth. Uh, how would you know about the last uh, last last point? Is very important and. Yes. I, Yes, and I encountered uh, a case like this before. So, yeah. what would what would make you think about uh, external loss of uh, volume, like retroperitoneal bleeding? Uh, maybe if this patient underwent a peripheral attempt of uh, very good. So, yeah, catheterization <laughs> or even an emergency sitting. Maybe this patient has a, a peripheral cannulation for ECMO or so. Very good. Uh, uh, yeah, multiple attempts for puncture for the femoral uh, or either uh, iliac, maybe he will have the same Yes, case. very good. And what else? What do you think uh, about the CVB? What? What do you think uh, will happen to your CVB in other scenarios and if you have an external bleeding? CVB will drop. Yeah, so in other cases, if you have, uh, if you don't have uh, drainage because the blood is collecting in the, in the, in the veins, the your CVB will go higher. But in this case, uh, your CVB will go lower and your venous drainage will go lower. Yes. And yeah, and of course, uh, what you said is very important, anticipating the problem. So if you are, if you have this, uh, the case that I encountered was in, uh, was after peripheral cannulation, femoral cannulation. And uh, unfortunately, uh, they tried to manage with giving, giving blood and uh, all the other uh, maneuver that we talked about. And they discovered uh, lately that uh, she's, she was having a retroperitoneal hemorrhage and uh, unfortunately she died because of this. So, uh, yeah, yeah, unfortunately I encountered like similar case just this week. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, uh, again, anyway, thank you, continue. Okay, now uh, furthermore, our next scenario, after placing the aortic cross clamp and uh, the heart is arrested, the perfusionist now alerts you that there is poor venous drainage. 
and you noted a large amount of uh, air in the aortic cannula. And you are certain this air has entered the uh, systemic circulation and suspecting that it embolized to the brain. Uh, mostly the level of the venous uh, reservoir has gone down too low and the air has been pumped into the arterial line. What do you do in this point? Anyone? We have 51 participants and no one is participating. So uh, first you'd uh, need to stop the bump, clamp both lines, um, and then you need to retrogradely uh, uh, flow through the venous site. Uh, you'd also need to put the patient head down and uh, you need to call him down as well. I think these are the maneuvers that you need to do when management of uh, air emboli through the arterial line. Okay. Excellent answer, but uh, don't forget, and, and uh, this is one of the catastrophic situations. Don't forget, uh, in catastrophic situation, to say, I will call for help, inform the team, and then everything you said is correct. Did you say cooling down, right? Yes, cooling down. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so this is a case of air embolism. Even though massive air embolism after initiation of bypass, is rare. Uh, uh, the incidence is less than 0.2% of the cases. It has a high mortality and high incidence of neurological injury. Uh, it commonly happens if the blood level in the venous reservoir and oxygenator go has gone too low, allowing air to introduce to the arterial surface. Do you so, have, mm. Before you go to the management, do you have, uh, do you know of any other uh, sources of major air embolism that can happen during bypass other than the uh, venous reservoir? Disconnection of the line or breakage of the line or the tubing? Breakage will cause the blood spillage. Yes. No, no. How it, uh, it, not, it will not usually cause air to go in because you have blood going out. Uh, inappropriate uh, cross clamping with the uh, open uh, cardiac uh, or intracardiac uh, procedure? Yeah, yeah, that can happen. Uh, okay. Maybe well, the flow, maybe the flow of the, <clears throat> when you forward the flow and then you forward the uh, past, it creates bubbles. So your voice is interrupting. Hi. Yeah, I was saying that maybe the when you forward, you forward when the perfusion is forward uh, fast, then it creates bubbles. So we have to forward slowly. Um, maybe, but this is easy to detect because this is one of the uh, standard uh, safety measures that we do after connecting the line. Another source. Okay. Uh... Hold on. Uh, another source is uh, the aortic root vent. It, uh, the perfusionist can uh, reduce air through it uh, by mistake. Exactly, and this happened. And I, uh, I, I did not see it, but uh, it happened uh, in one of the centers that uh, I worked in. Uh, so uh, one of the... Yeah, so, so you know, the, 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 Dr. Khalid explained how the, the vent works, right? It works uh, through the roller bump. So if you can imagine the, uh, uh, the uh, roller pump or the, the, uh, the lines that are, con the vent lines that are connected to the roller pump are connected uh, on the opposite side. Uh, the roller pump, when it rolls, uh, instead of uh, sucking uh, the air, it will, uh, it will uh, push the air um, to, the, to the patient. So uh, that's exactly what happened uh, with that patient. And uh, he had a massive uh, stroke. So uh, one of the safety measures that is being done uh, with some of uh, our colleagues that uh, before, uh, before using the vents, uh, once they have it from the, from the uh, 
once uh, before they use the event, they put it in a saline and they ask the pathogenist to uh, to, uh, to to turn it on and uh, they check if it is sucking or if it's bubbling. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. So uh, I found this uh, algorithm at Tisra, you can check it. But mostly you need to ask for help, uh, ask your perfusionist to stop the pump, clamp both arterial and venous line, and uh, place your patient in turning curve position. Uh, try to aspirate the air as much as you can, and uh, then you have to disconnect the cannula from the uh, the arterial line, try to hook it to the venous line and try to uh, retrograde diffuse the uh, brain uh, for uh, mostly two minutes. And uh, after that, you need to cool down the patient for brain protection and complete your procedure. And uh, upon weaning, the anesthetist uh, may uh, uh, Give the patient barbiturate and manitol and for uh, deep uh, anesthesia for uh, two days in the ICU. And for post operative uh, management. Uh, you go to post operative management now after you connected the uh, cannula to the, to the SPC for retrograde perfusion to the brain and for flushing. Uh, you said for like two minutes, but this is very crude. Uh, do, you, do you have any uh, other? Um, ideas of uh, how to know that uh, you flushed most of the air from the brain? Maybe I can see air bubbles in the vent. Exactly. So uh, if, you, you, if you have the open hour to our vent, you will, you will see the bubbles coming out until you see clear. But yes. Yeah. Even if it takes 10 minutes and two minutes, is, uh, this is uh, just a number. Yeah, I, actually, I've read this and I believe I've heard it from Dr. Rakan in one of his uh, lecture in the crash course. Uh, yeah, and a few minutes of retrograde perfusion are uh, enough for this. What if you still have bubbles after four minutes? You will stop. Uh, what I understood, it's very difficult to inspect air. Uh, anyway, my message is just uh, to de air until de airing yes. is appropriate. Okay. Regardless of the time. Oh. So uh, for uh, post-operative management in the ICU, they need to consider hyperbaric chamber and deep sedation for brain protection. So next, our scenario, after uh, re-institution your bypass, your uh, perfusionist cannot get the mean blood pressure above uh, 40 millimeter mercury. And the anesthetist, uh, the anesthetist uh, inform you that the patient has been on high dose of ACE inhibitor preoperatively. Uh, what do you do next? What do you think about? What do you have in this case? Vasoplastic patient. I, I think you answered correctly, Dr. Ayat, but your voice is traveling. It's a case of uh, vasoplegia. Vasoplegia. Yes. Yes. So it, this case can be seen uh, mostly in patients on numerous antihypertensive medications, especially ACE inhibitor. In this situation, phenylphorine, nor epi, uh, vasopressin, or even methylene blue can be used uh, to increase the systemic pressure. So our uh, last scenario. After you placed your uh, coronary sinus catheter for retrograde cardioplegia, uh, this patient has a moderate aortic rigor. As you start your retrograde infusion, the pressure within the coronary sinus seems to be very low. And you inspected the inferior aspect of the heart to make sure the, uh, the sinus is not ruptured uh, or the uh, cannula is malpositioned. Uh, you take out the, ca the catheter to inspect the balloon, it's intact. You re in place it in uh, the uh, sinus. Again, the position is confirmed by palpation. Despite this, the pressure remains low in the coronary sinus and the heart is not arresting. What are the causes of this problem? In so patient is having a having AR. That's why the uh, 
having an hour, that's why the car, the car visa was not enough to arrest the hours? No, we inserted the retrograde uh, cannula because this patient has a uh, moderate uh, AR. Oh, yeah, so retrograde, it was done. Okay. Yes. So we have low pressure in the coronary sinus. There is inadequate perfusion for retrograde uh, cardioplegia. Why? Uh, maybe man positioning or displacement of the sure catheter. The, we made sure that the, the catheter is not misplaced, the pallone is intact, the sinus is not ruptured. Just that, that it's still the pressure is low. Could it be because you have a persistent uh, left SVC? Very this nice. One, yes. Yeah, I agree with uh, the professor. Yes. Very so, nice. uh, in case of inadequate retrograde uh, cardioplegia, there I think is that was Dr. Walid, right? I know, actually, the, na the names I cannot see. Oh, Walid, I guess, yeah. I agree with you, Dr. Walid. So, as we mentioned, first, uh, when you discovered that it's low or inadequate uh, retrograde plesia delivery, first you need to inspect the uh, coronary sinus for any signs of rupture. Uh, make sure your catheter is in uh, place. Uh, inspect the balloon if, if it's intact or no. And you need to consider a persistent uh, left-sided superior vena cava. In this case, if you have a left-sided superior vena in a cable, uh, you need to place a, uh, a snare to occlude it uh, since there is a large innominate vein. And in case if there's no persistent innominate vein, you may cannulate uh, the uh, left uh, SVC separately. So furthermore, in the uh, step of maintaining the bypass, you need to check for acystole. Your, your cross clamp is properly placed. Anti-grade or retrograde cardioplegia are de delivered uh, smoothly. The aortic vent is on. Uh, you need to check uh, optimal MAVS pressure. Uh, the flow is usually 2.1 to 2.5 liter per minute and uh, assist the uh, perfusion uh, by uh, lactate, venous saturation, and urine output. Uh, proper uh, cooling of uh, mild hypothermia may allow decrease uh, of the flow if needed. And uh, check for the proper drainage. You need to uh, make sure the heart is empty, the CVP and the pulmonary pressure is low. And uh, last, you need to check for saturations, ABGs, oxygenation, and visual inspection of arterial blood. The ABCs of this steps is make sure the uh, heart is arrested well for myocardial protection. Uh, patient is uh, well oxygenated and uh, well perfused. In case of oxygenation, uh, inadequate uh, systemic oxygenation uh, can result in uh, tissue ischemia and acidosis and potentially resulting in multi-system organ dysfunction. If the saturation is low, uh, it's often noted during rewarming and coming off bypass, this problem can be uh, um, mitigated by improving the systemic flow rates and increase of the hematocrit. Evidence of cerebral oxygen desaturation uh, is first evident by cerebral oximetry, then pulse oximeter, then eventually systemic venous uh, desaturation. A, a systemic arterial desaturation may also result uh, from a catastrophic problem uh, requiring immediate uh, attention, including fail uh, failure of oxygenator or oxygen blender, or uh, in case of disconnection from the oxygen source. Uh, this problem or issue should be addressed early. Uh, it might also result from an aortic dissection or uh, malperfusion syndrome. A uh, pump issue should be immediately recognized by changing the, co of the color of the blood in the arterial line. So we had, uh, we had a case last week um, with a uh, problem in oxygenation. So uh, once uh, we went on pump, the uh, the arterial line uh, color was uh, black, just like the venous uh, line. So uh, what happened is that the perfusionist uh, uh, forgot to connect the uh, 
the oxygen source to the blender. So these things happen. So you have to keep it uh, in your mind. Yes. And uh, one of the things that you have to look at after you connect, oxygen, for, uh, once you go on bump, no, just by looking, what? look at, look at the color. Looking at the blood color, okay. Yeah, of your arterial line. Okay, thank you, Dr. Matala. Mm -hmm. So at the end, this schedule submit the uh, potential problems on pump and weaning of bypass. And for highlight, patient undergoing bypass require a, a comprehensive workup preoperatively to minimize the risk of uh, perioperative complication. The phases of bypass are induction and cannulation, maintenance and separation. You need to be familiar with the critical elements of each of these phases. Uh, for complication, air embolism, dissection, venous uh, perforation are a major adverse event and uh, you, you need to uh, uh, make sure to be a, a proper to anticipate and uh, prevent and deal with these complications if occur. Uh, Board drainage uh, can result in air locks, uh, from air locks and uh, inappropriate uh, positioning of the cannula and persistent uh, left ventricular uh, vena cava. And uh, sorry, uh, left uh, SVC. And uh, an empty heart with a poor drainage suggests loss of blood volume, as we mentioned, retroperitoneal or peritoneal hematoma. These are my uh, references. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, so thank you very much. Excellent scenario and excellent lecture. Uh, very beneficial and very important. Uh, what if you have... Um, and a retrograde aortic dissection after um, femoral artery uh, cannulation. What would you do? Retrograde dissection. Mm -hmm. You will call for help, inform the team, and then stop the pump, and then. Maybe change to the other uh, side or commence auxiliary uh, calculation? Auxiliary will take time. So uh, in, um, it's, uh, your answer is correct. So again, it's the same principles. We, don't, we, don't, we want to stop the problem, so we will stop the bomb. And we want to uh, resume perfusion, so we will continue perfusion at integrately from the ascending aorta at this time. And uh, the difference is bet uh, between retrograde and anti-grade dissection, that in anti-grade dissection, in retrograde dissection, uh, when you uh, commence uh, perfusion through the ascending aorta, um, perfusion will be adequate, and you can continue your surgery. And, and uh, after surgery, you then uh, you have to um, properly diagnose and manage the problem of retrograde dissection. But the most important uh, step in this, um, in this uh, complication is to identify it and to uh, change the position of the cannula to integrate. I have a question, Dr. Masala. Uh, to begin with, uh, you wouldn't start femoral bypass unless you, the chest wouldn't be open in the first place. So can you change to the other leg instead of the one that you had the dissection in? Why you no? Um, you you can, and I mean, I mean in cases like uh, you start, you are doing uh, um, a redo, for example, or um, or uh, or I an mean, invasive case, and you electively cannulated the femoral uh, arteries, and then you open the chest, and then you will not start uh, your cardiovascular bypass before you start your procedure. So your chest is already open. Uh, and you're if you're talking about like emergency cases, and uh, you like uh, ECMO or something like this, and you started your bypass before opening the chest. Uh, actually, I'm not sure um, if you can change to the other side, maybe, but uh, I'm not sure. It will propagate the dissection again, uh, the other side. I think the anti-grade uh, anti anti uh, cannulation is uh, the best option in, in such scenario. I think yeah, you, you can you can for of course you, you will go step by step. You will call for help and uh, inform the team and stop the bomb. And uh, now, if the patient is uh, the patient, if the, if the patient is not arrested, you will just uh, go back to your uh, native uh, cardiac output. 
if the patient is uh, and that's it if the patient is, uh, is the patient should not be arrested so uh, you still have your circulation if the chest is not open and you did not put your cross clamal calibrigi so yeah. I, ha this... I have uh, an argument, if you don't mind, regarding this issue. Sure. Uh, we, we, when we try uh, to change the cannulation site, we are trying to prevent uh, propagation of the dissection. Mm -hmm. But uh, maybe we don't know. Maybe the dissection already has reached, if it's late, let's say it's retrograde dissection, maybe has already reached the root. And if it's anti-grade, maybe it had reached the bifurcation and one of the iliac. I mean, does it worth uh, putting the patient on uh, circ arrest uh, without even cooling or protective measurement uh, for at least five minutes? Even though I think at situations like this, uh, femoral cannulation can be, I, I've never attended this, alhamdulillah, but, uh, such a uh, complication. Thing, but but uh, you cannot go to, uh, into circulatory, I would deep hypothermic circulatory arrest without bypass. I, 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 um, uh, let's say the patient had a dissection while putting the uh, aortic cannula, Where? Uh, the arterial cannula, uh, either mm -hmm. in the femoral or in the, um, in the uh, uh, let's say neat. central, let's say central, oh. femoral, uh, it's easier, central. Okay. Uh, if we put, uh, let's say while putting the, when we already, I already put the, the arterial cannula and while cross clamping the aorta, either in case of an aneurysm or uh, an aneurysm, usually their walls are weak. The patient had a dissection, the aorta became bluish and uh, more swollen uh, and he had a dissection. Uh, should I uh, stop the circulation completely, even though the patient is not uh, uh, in, uh, is hypothermic? Yes. Just to stop propagation of a dissection that may have already reached the common uh, iliac. Yes, of course. Because uh, I feel I feel like it's uh, we can just reduce the flow and perfuse whatever is uh, both lumens until what's at least the, they can see. The point, but what is the point of giving any flow to a false lumen? It's not, it's not perfusing anything. It's just I going can... between the intima and the media and just going there. It will so increase the dissection, actually, if you go there. Yeah. Uh, but no. let's say I have a TEE and made sure that my cannula, or at least I is taken. It's TEE takes time, and this situation should be managed within seconds. So um, can, you are can trying the femoral, to like, can the femoral be TEE. cannulated fast? Uh, sure. This is the this is what you what you should do. But you should stop the bomb, and then do the femoral cannula, and uh, simultaneously. Uh, your team doing the uh, femoral cannulation, or you but change do, with the during aortic. which during with this time? How can I protect the heart? At Nothing. Least? You cannot the heart, the brain. You mean uh, uh, the 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 heart the brain, uh, at this time? Brain, you have you have like six. To, um, um, if I'm not mistaken, you have like uh, eight minutes before uh, reversible damage is uh, is done to the brain tissue. So, and the heart. Uh, and the heart, and the heart you, you are putting your cross clamp uh, and uh, the heart can't tolerate, tolerate ischemia for some time. And uh, if, if you remove your cross clamp, uh, you have two lumens. You have the true lumen and the false lumen. Some, mm. of, the, of, some of the blood will go to the, to the coronaries. Uh, anyway, you, in this situation, uh, don't try to think about you know, a lot of things. You have to manage one thing now, uh, mm. which is the dissection. Mm. And uh, to manage it, you have to stop the problem and resume the perfusion. And then you think about everything else. Uh, even of, of the potential complication, like if I will have uh, myocardial ischemia, I will have, uh, uh, I will have uh, stroke. stroke. Maybe, maybe you will have it. But in this, in this uh, situation, in this time, you should manage the current problem, which is the, the, the dissection. You manage it by stopping the problem, Resuming the perfusion and then do whatever you want. You do TEE, you might have a stroke, what you will do. That, that uh, it happened already, but you have to manage that situation at that time. And then you will do everything else. But, but, uh, but uh, if you say this, in, uh, if you say I will uh, resume uh, perfusion with a low flow uh, through mm. the same side of the, um, of the dissection, uh, this is very. Um, very critical answer, and it, uh, it might be one of the fatal mistakes in, in oral exams. The so, thing is, I'm trying to, uh, for the exam, I now know 
Uh, and even for your way to answer it but in, uh, practically uh, let's say you said you have to have your own assistant do no, don't your... understand me even practic even in your life inshallah يعني ما تشوفها يعني بس even in your life yeah. you should not uh, continue perfusion through a suspected dissection i see yeah H- have you attended one doctor murtaba inshallah لا I want to know the the chances of the patient living even after an intraoperative for for aortic for uh, ascending aortic dissection uh, iatrogenic ascending aortic dissection if it mm-hmm. happens during the if it is discovered and managed during the procedure if I remember correctly the mortality is around 30% if That's even very low. 30% is good It's very yeah, low. It's good. Yes. It's, it's good. I, 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 But the patient, don't forget, he came for a cabbage with mortality rate of one to two percent. Anyway, nice. uh, if it happened, uh, and if it happened, uh, if if the dissection, uh, if you did not discover the dissection, uh, for example, if it's like uh, it was just a small flab, and your mm. cannula still in the uh, in the, in the true lumen, but there is a flab uh, still there is a flab, but it's uh, beyond the tip of your cannula. And after you decannulate, this flab has propagated. Propagated. The mm-hmm. happened post-op. The, the reported uh, mortality for such a case is more than 50%, because, you know, which is logical. The patient is already outside of the OR. The diagnosis is late. The complications uh, will accumulate. And for retrograde uh, dissection, the iatrogenic retrograde dissection, the if it is not discovered, the mortality rate, uh, if I'm not mistaken, also uh, like 50 to 60%. I see. Thank you, Dr. Murtaba. Welcome. Uh, May I just uh, comment? Please. Um, regarding the cannulation of the ascending aorta, I'm not sure if it's intraoperative dissection. But a Seldinger technique to cannulate the ascending is a well-documented uh, technique uh, with a dissection in the ascending aorta using TEE guidance. And uh, many senior surgeons use that. Uh, another uh, technique uh, could ca- and uh, consider a safe technique to perfuse the organs. Another technique would be trans. Uh, I forgot what it's called. It's a Japanese technique uh, to transect the aorta and put under guidance the uh, the uh, just in a matter of seconds, put it in the true lumen and uh, snare it, snare the aorta, and it, it's uh, reported in in a uh, big series with good results. So that's another way to do it. Although, and dissection of the femoral and dissection of the can can pretty take some time with even with some uh, experienced surgeons, uh, especially in obese patients. It can be buried inside, and you struggle with it. That's why such technique, transecting the aorta, putting it in the, into the true lumen, might be an alternative in such cases. Uh, I I know about these techniques in uh, in type A aortic dissection, but yeah. not in yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lo. I samurai. Yeah, samurai. It's called samurai. Yeah, but in uh, in iatrogenic aortic dissection due, due to cannulation, I'm not sure if it's safe to do it uh, because uh, in in uh, in cases of uh, type A aortic dissection, you already have. Uh, Have an imaging, and uh, you know where is your uh, you you know where is your flaps, and you know what is the anatomy of the pathology inside the aorta. So you can imagine and uh, and plan your uh, perfusion. Um, but in this case, um, and if you can follow with me, you just uh, you just put your cannula, and you have this dissection. You don't know uh, if this dissection is. Uh, is uh, if, if the false lumen is taking the whole uh, ascending aorta, for example. So um, with putting the Seldinger, Seldinger needle uh, blindly, um, uh, how would you know that uh, you reach the, uh, the uh, true, true lumen or not? And, I think, and, uh, and uh, transecting the aorta will cause a lot of uh, bleeding in the field. Uh, which is, uh, you know, nauseans. But yeah, it's 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 very easy to imagine that if you transect it, you can see the flaps. 
but uh, how would you deal with all of all of this uh, blood return uh, especially that you already stopped your pump it's uh, i think it's uh, it's um, it's really not a controlled situation and uh, in such emergency in, this is this is more critical than going for uh, for aortic dissection and i think the the safest answer uh, and the more controlled situation is the scenario that we already talked about and uh, mentioned in uh, almost all books of cardiac surgery. And uh, for, for femoral cannulation, for femoral cannulation, it wouldn't take the, the, the time that you uh, that you imagine. It just takes minutes. That you will just incise and uh, dissect, and uh, within you should be there within two minutes. And you don't even need to put uh, your purse string. You can just stab and put your cannula. And after you put the cannula and start your perfusion, uh, your assistant can hold the cannula and then you can stick your first string uh, around it. So uh, maybe, regarding maybe you can do to, that, but yeah. I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't use this uh, answer. Yeah, uh, I agree in, in, in exam settings, yes, probably, probably yes. Uh, but in a, a, a real life situation. Even yeah. even in real life uh, real life situation, uh, tech, uh, practically uh, it seems very practical. Um, uh, Seldinger technique it's been used uh, regularly. You confirm it uh, very accurately with TEE, um, uh, and you will get uh, uh, the backflow. Uh, samurai technique I did not go into it in detail. In detail, you need to go. You will just go around the aorta uh, both uh, sides. When you go both sides of the aorta, uh, you have you will have control of the of the whole aorta. You will not get uh, any back uh, back bleeding. Uh, not necessarily transecting circumferentially the whole aorta, uh, but uh, probably most of it. And if you see many senior surgeons, even when they do aortic procedure, they 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 open the aorta nearly two thirds of it. Uh, so opening it the same th uh, same uh, thing it would be more practical, and I absolutely disagree with you regarding the easy the the e, uh, the easiness of uh, cannulation the femoral side. I've seen, as I said, senior surgeon taking uh, time with the femoral, especially in uh, in in obese patients or a redo with previous casts, multiple casts, and adhesion at that site. But uh, uh, I agree to the, to disagree. <laughs> anyway, so you can use any kind of uh, of. Uh, can, uh, I can I answer this, <laughs> uh, Anyway, so uh, we agree right, that have to stop the propagation and uh, resume perfusion. You can use Seldinger technique, whatever technique you want, Seldinger uh, um, um femoral whatever you want to use, but uh, the important thing is to resume perfusion. Use whatever you're comfortable with. Further, problem. Okay. Uh, about uh, heterogeneous orthopedic dissection, uh, I have been through this uh, once. Uh, actually, we were not uh, sure if it's true orthopedic dissection, but uh, it was clear the blue deterioration of uh, ascending orthopedic. Uh, what the surgeon uh, did, actually he stopped the pump, he removed aortic cannula, and uh, he took uh, two deep stitches at the site of the cannulation. The, uh, what uh, he thought, he will close the entry point. If there is any dissection, he will close entry point. Uh, then he cannulates in other site, and uh, it went uh, smoothly, and uh, it was uh, successful. Did he confirm the uh, the uh, new aortic cannulation uh, by TE before going? No, actually, uh, this this was in uh, charity, and uh, uh, we didn't have uh, equal there. But but of course he checked with the perfusionist and uh, he checked the pressure and the line. And no, the the, actually at that time uh, there was uh, the flow bypass uh, is good, but the declaration of uh, of uh, ascending aorta also there was uh, blue declaration of ascending aorta. 
I think uh, that's why it was at that uh, time it, uh, we thought mm. it's safe to remove the cannula and mm. to take a deep stitch. Hmm? Yeah, I think that's why he was encouraged. And this to was uh, mm. successful. Because the blood pressure was the blood pressure was maintained, right? The blood pressure was maintained, um, and yet the only thing that you had is the, 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 the yeah the blood pressure mm -hmm. was maintained. The, the blood discoloration, yes, yes. Only yes. discoloration, yes, yeah. But I, this is yeah, this is uh, what we are talking about is a clear uh, aortic dissection, and in terms of uh, low blood pressure and uh, and high arterial line pressure, plus the other signs of aortic dissection. Uh, yani meaning that you know that you cannot uh, perfuse the patient. I, yeah, this yeah. is the so this is the main. Thing I mean, just I to, to to keep it. Yeah, to keep it uh, in your mind, yeah, you mm -hmm. can't take a deep stitch if you know the the cannulation size. You can't take deep stitch. You will close the entry point, and uh, you can think to cannulate in other side. If you go through yeah, the, this uh, scenario in the box. Um, you will go through these steps um, again, solving the bomb call and then cannulation. But all of what we are talking about is in the step of uh, after resuming perfu safe perfusion. So after we resume safe perfusion, then we inspect and diagnose and uh, solve the issue of dissection with whatever you want to do. You, deep stitch is, uh, is, is mentioned and uh, uh, that they're replacing the whole ascending aorta as mentioned, repairing as mentioned. This is another uh, issue, which is the management of the dissection. But what we are talking about in this lecture is cardiopulmonary bypass. So how to deal with it? You stop the problem and resume perfusion, and then you manage it whatever uh, way you like. Yes, uh, I think the message from this scenario, and uh, 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 if you discover the dissection and uh, during the bypass, uh, before a cross clamp, just change your uh, change your uh, cannulation size as soon as possible, and resume your per perfusion, perfusion, and uh, and that's it. And ask for help. This is the message for uh, for all of us. Thank you. Very good discussion. Uh, thank you all. And uh, if you have any more comments, anyone have any more ideas? You are more yeah, than welcome. Yeah, yeah Murtala, I agree with, with, with what you said. And what mentioned, what Abdullah mentioned is also is well documented in the literature, but I think for us as a newly practicing physicians, we just, we just need to follow what is safest for the patient. And maybe if you have the appropriate help with you, maybe you can try new things or uh, novel techniques. But uh, what Murtala mentioned is the safest answer, either in the exam or for a new practicing uh, physician just graduated from residency. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lai. So, uh... If uh, all agrees, I think uh, we can take like 10 minutes if there is no more comments. And uh, we can start the last session, uh, Lift Heart Bypass, with Dr. Abdelaziz Al Juhayim after 10 minutes.
دكتور عبد العزيز دكتور عبد العزيز تشيين يس دكتور طبعا يا هلا والله جاهز ان شاء الله ان شاء الله طيب if you want to prepare your slides and we can start after five minutes شور شور thank you
تفضل عزيز عزيز موجود اي نعم يلا كان ستارت السلام عليكم جود افتنون Uh, my lecture today will be in the left heart bypass. So we'll start with the introduction. Left heart bypass is a commonly used technique in descending thoracic aorta and aneurysm surgery. It is used primarily to uh, help uh, reduce the incidence of post-operative paraplegia and uh, paralysis. And the bypass is achieved by cannulation of pulmonary beam, left atrium, or uh, left ventricle and delivery of the blood via centrifugal bump to the aortic side distal to uh, aneurysm. This method uh, relies on patient lung to provide oxygen exchange. This is called partial bypass. The blood uh, removed from the left heart with a large venous cannula placed directly uh, into the left atrium or through left pulmonary veins. This carries the risk of air embolism if one is not careful due, uh, during insertion or and removal of this uh, cannula. Extracarboid circuits consist of tubing and sinking up pump. It does not include a reservoir, heat exchange, or a bubble trap. This minimizes need for hibernization. And uh, if no reservoir is included in the extracarboid circuit, uh, the anesthesiologist must be prepared to administer intravascular volume expander. Uh, this support system is not truly carbon bypass as they, there is no oxygenation of the blood, but simply bumping of the oxygenated blood from the left atrium to distal uh, arterial vessels. So the indication of left heart bypass we use it in descending thoracic aneurysm and dissection, and uh, in case of thoracoabdominal aneurysm and dissection. The goal of the left heart bypass to perfuse the body distal to the clamp place near to the aneurysm and dissection. And uh, the, the circus consists of inflow and outflow cannula, tubing, finger bump, uh, and no need uh, for a heat exchanger or oxygenator needed and no heparin needed, and some uh, places they will give um, 100, unit, uh, 100 units per kg to maintain the patency. So cannulation, the proximal cannulation, uh, we use some in left atrium via the left atrial appendage or either of left pulmonary veins, usually left inferior pulmonary veins, and this is cannulation in the femoral artery or in the descending aortic distal to the bone. So the monitoring, we monitor the arterial pressure lines placed in uh, right uh, radial artery and the radial femoral artery to maintain both methods of perfusion during left heart bypass. Uh, right arterial measures the proximal uh, pressures used uh, in case left subclavian artery in aneurysmal and has to be clamped and reinstalled. And, and the right femoral uh, measures distal uh, pressures used because the left uh, femoral artery can be used for cannulations. Perfusion uh, area approximate to the clamp are perfused by the heart's ejection normally into the ascending aorta, and the area distal to, uh, distal to a clamp perfused uh, by the left heart bypass machine. Increase the left heart bypass flow rate will steal more volume from the uh, LB and uh, reduce proximal blood pressure, but will increase distal blood pressure. The vasodilator and the uh, left heart bypass flow rate and the addition of fluid are most commonly practiced to maintain the both blood pressures. So <clears throat> the techniques of left heart bypass is based essentially on uh, the withdrawal of oxygen blood, uh, oxygenated blood from the left heart of the circulation by the left atrium, by the left atrial bandage, or uh, by the left atrial, uh, left uh, pulmonary veins, and the apex of the left ventricle, and, or the aorta itself, uh, or one of the major proximal arch branches. Here, the videos show uh, that the mechanism of uh, cannulation of the left heart bypass. So for the cannulation for the uh, heart, left heart bypass, one uh, can choose between the left atrial appendage, 
one of the primary veins or the proximal uh, artery itself, if the anatomy of aneurysm allowed. Uh, manipulation of the left atrial appendage with forceps or needles uh, may cause rhythm disturbance leading to uh, hemodynamic instability. So some uh, prefer the pulmonary vein for cannulation. So, so the cannulation for the artery as first step, usually the left common femoral artery. And uh, then uh, the second uh, steps usually uh, cannulate of the left artery uh, as a, a case of the uh, second step. Uh, the, the, the left pulmonary vein is inside and the incision is immediately closed with the, the left uh, index finger to avoid the entrance of the air into the left heart. The incision into the left pulmonary vein may be slightly dilated and allowed to easily uh, entrance of the cannula. That you know that the surgeons um, introduced uh, will introduce the angle of the cannula with the where the assistants uh, include the end of the cannula. Yeah, with the thumb again to prevent air uh, being stuck into the left heart, and also that the anot can be place, uh, including the clamp on the end of the uh, cannula. So both techniques are uh, closed. So this, so um, the surgeon uh, introduce and stabilize the cannula into the initial position with the tip of uh, cannula allowed toward the, the assistant. And if the cannula is uh, left alone, um, the tip may uh, uh, draft toward the mitral valve, causing uh, unwanted cardiac problem. The cannula is fixed with the sutures uh, together with both uh, tourniquets. So by moving the... Uh, by the moving of the end of the cannula toward the lower liver, the cannula will fit itself after removal of the thumb from the end. A clamp is placed uh, on the end of the cannula. Eventually, if necessary, extra fluid can be added. The connection between the cannula and the tubing is made. Uh, the pump started and cannula fixed with skin in right position after the perfusion to confirm that the adequate flow can be obtained. So when the blood, uh, when the bump is stopped, the left atrial cannula is uh, removed first because the blood in the circuit can be reinfused with the femoral artery cannula, which uh, which is at that moment uh, site in situ, and the fixation uh, ligament are cut and the cannula is withdrawal and consent both pushing string suture and immediately uh, standing and tight. So both. Inlet and out, um, out uh, inflow and outflow artery are clamped proximal and distal from the suture diagram graft. The tubing is shortening, leaving a rim about one to two uh, uh, milli. Running proline suture is used to close the remnants of the prosthesis. And uh, later, uh, the both vascular clamp are removed. Um, after uh, flushing and check the uh, anti-grade and retrograde flush. Mm -hmm. 
So with the both uh, vascular clamp uh, uh, are removed, and after flushing and shaking the integrated degrade flow, the suture is tight, and the anastomosis uh, as well as the pulsation are checked. Thank you all for uh, listening and uh, any question for uh, uh, about the left heart bypass. Thank you, Khal. Yatiklavi. Hi, Sual Shabab. Thank you, everybody. We we'll conclude our session for today. Thank you.